Welcome to this Border Focal Point Network Breakfast Debate Beyond Borders. Uh, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity again to uh, moderate our discussion. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion uh, on the subject of cross-border public transport. Uh, I am Andrew Lansley. I'm Strategic Council at Low Europe, and we have the privilege and pleasure of working with DG Regio and our colleagues at the European Commission uh, in helping to organise these fascinating uh, breakfast debates and the Border Focal Point Network. Um, the format for today's discussion is that uh, I will introduce uh, Pascal Boymans to, uh, uh, to, to lead us into the debate and to introduce the uh, forthcoming study uh, on uh, cross-border public transport. Uh, I will then um, uh, lead into a series of presentations about the report, which we're hoping to, to see published in forthcoming weeks, um, which I've had the uh, great privilege of seeing a draft. I have to say, it is the most impressive piece of work. And I, can I just say at the outset, um, my congratulations to those who've been responsible from whom you will be hearing during the course of our discussion, who I think have undertaken some really um, important research, something that people will continue to look to uh, as a basis for understanding the challenges uh, and indeed the solutions for um, improving the quality and the accessibility of transport across borders. Um, the, the, the purpose of uh, today's discussion is to introduce this to give you a sense of the um, importance of cross-border public transport. It's the many uh, places across Europe where it is uh, a, a key issue and how we can facilitate those cross-border activities using public transport as a mechanism, improving uh, mobility, improving employment, improving quality of life, improving sustainability, all uh, uh, objectives of our collective endeavor. So let me begin, uh, if I may please, by uh, asking you to, um, to take the first poll. Now we have during the course of our discussion today, two polls. This is the first one. Uh, and could you please choose the main obstacle to initiating cross-border public transport in your region, selecting one of those five options for the main obstacle? And we, I will report back on the conclusion of that poll uh, at the uh, end of the first opening set of discussions. So let me come into the, uh, the initial presentations about the study. Uh, and to introduce those, uh, I will be joined by Pascal Boymans, whom you will see on our panel here. Um, Pascal will introduce that first. Then I will go to Claudia D'Astasio, who is the senior expert at TRT Transportier Territorio. Uh, and uh, Claudio will introduce the web viewer to you. And then following that, uh, Sabine Zilma, uh, who is partner and head of the Berlin office at Spatial Foresight, uh, will uh, introduce the report further, give you further detail about the forthcoming report. So let me please hand over initially to Pascal Boymans. Pascal, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And also a warm welcome from, from me here from, from DG Regio in Brussels. Uh, to this breakfast meeting where we're going to discuss indeed this study on cross-border public transport uh, services and um, happy to hear about your positive introduction because indeed I think it's a document which is very rich in information and contains a lot of interesting information and of course during the, the breakfast meeting which is limited to, to a bit more than one hour we cannot touch upon everything so I think I see this breakfast meeting mainly as a trigger and as an invitation for for people who are interested to to read the document in more detail once it is uh, published in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, I think it's the first time that there's a pan-European study available on public transport and, and, and on cross-border services. So I think it's, it's important to mark that moment that we first, for the first time, we have this total overview of, uh, of the European Union of this type of uh, services within the, uh, within the Union. Um, I will leave the, the, of course, the presentation and the details up to the experts. Uh, we did indeed a great job uh, to Claudia and Sabine later on. But I would like to, to uh, inform you once more how this study fits within a larger scope and of activities which we're doing right now. 
In one of the previous breakfast meetings, we discussed our report on uh, living labs of border regions as living labs of European integration. Uh, and uh, in this, this report, we identified four clusters uh, along which we wanted to work uh, here in DG Regio on border regions. And one of those four clusters was about how to further development uh, cross-border public services in a general sense. Um, because the idea behind this is that we see that people living in border regions on average are less, less, less well served by public services. And we're talking now about public transport. It can also be about health or education or any other public service. Uh, and uh, what we would like to see that we are moving more towards seeing border regions as one functional area where, uh, first of all, these public services have a larger area to serve. So it becomes more profitable also from an economic point of view for those services to, 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 do, to run their services. And secondly, as, a, as a, the important most effect is that, of course, then the people living in the border regions have better access to these services. So that's the background why we're doing these studies. And today we're discussing public transport, but we have also been doing already studies on, uh, on the health sector. Uh, we're doing another study on public services in parallel right now in general. And we also did a study already on missing railway links uh, three years ago. So this is study is not a standalone product, but uh, fits in a range of uh, other initiatives. Um, and uh, so that's the, 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 the background and how the study fits in a wider framework. And of course, public transport is a key, uh, key element if you want to improve the accessibility to those other services, for example, like health or like education. Like if students want to move to want to travel to university on the other side of the border, they need to have good public transport services. The same applies to patients if they want to go to a good hospital on the other side of the border. At least there should be good public transport services available. So it's a key factor for uh, how we can see further exploiting the development potential of border regions. And then I would like to leave it up to here for as an introduction from my side, and I would like to hand over back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Pascal. That's an excellent uh, introduction and sets the context perfectly. Um, but to hear about the, the report, let's begin with uh, Claudio de Stasio, please. Would you, Claudio, would you uh, first take us into the report and particularly the web viewer, please? For sure. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just uh, let me share my screen for introducing you to the web viewer which is one of the components we have delivered within the study uh, that is available at this web address www.crossbordertransport.eu and uh, accessing uh, this uh, can you see my screen yes ah, perfect okay so um, you can see that you are redirected to a web map where um, we have uh, displayed the border region as we have defined, which is basically is a buffer of 25 kilometers uh, uh, on each side of the national border. Plus we have also uh, defined an extended border region, which is this in light yellow, um, which includes uh, all those uh, towns and cities uh, that uh, um, uh, are far from uh, less than 25 kilometers from the border of the border region. So basically, this is how we have identified uh, and defined the border region within, within the study. Um, you can see on the left part of this uh, uh, web map, a list of layers that you can turn on and off. And for example, in relation to the rail services, by clicking on these two layers, you can see that the cross-border rail services appear on the map. And by clicking on a specific link, you can see all the rail services that are using that link. So in this case, uh, a pop-up opens uh, and uh, you can see the key information related to the cross-border service, uh, um, the origin and destination country, the, the name of the connection, the operator, and other important sources, for example, the frequency 
in the different seasons and the, the number of average runs per day for each rail service. Similarly, you can also click on, um, on the station, a key information on the station appears. This is available, this kind of information is available for all the public transport services that we have covered in the study. So we have a similar kind of information for bus services, but we have also included the train, uh, tram services and also ferry services. So you can see here that by clicking on, on the map, they, um, they appear. Uh, besides this, we have also um, prepared some uh, summary information within, um, within this web map, which shows uh, um, some key um, results for our study. For example, the um, for, for, for each border segment, we have prepared a layer showing the total number of cross-border services crossing uh, that specific border segment uh, um, in relation to the specific transport mode that they uh, cover. Uh, we have also prepared um, a summary map showing for each country the number of total cross-border um, public transport services and by clicking on a specific country, you can see the distribution between these different transport modes of the above mentioned services. The map also allows you to select some different backgrounds according to the, to the visualization need. You can have also a blank background. And the most important, um, you, by clicking on this icon, you can access to a document which provides you with the key definition of the border region and of the extended border region, and also on the um, content of each layer showing the, uh, the, the, the information that we have collected within uh, the, the web map. Um, so um, this is all from, uh, from my side. I hope you will enjoy surfing this, uh, this uh, web viewer. Claudia, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, sorry, can you just r remind us, uh, how do people access the web viewer? Where, where do they go to do this? Yes, uh, they can uh, access to the web viewer by clicking on this link, www.crossbordertransport.eu. And they don't require a password or anything in order to do that. Absolutely. It's uh, free and accessible from, uh, from every uh, computer without any password. That's absolutely fascinating. And that's available now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. An endless uh, source of information. And um, what about updating, Claudia? How does that work in, uh, as, you go, as we go forward? And this is something that we have to, to still uh, define and agree because uh, the development of uh, um, this uh, inventory of cross-border uh, transport services uh, has required uh, collecting information from several sources uh, and uh, um, especially from uh, GTFS files provided by um, public transport authorities all over Europe. So, uh, it has required uh, um, an extensive uh, work in data collection and also data harmonization, especially for some, uh, um, some kind of transport services where um, there is not a centralized uh, European level information system. So this is something that we will, uh, we will discuss uh, and, um, with the DG region in, in the future. It is important also to specify that the information we have collected here is related to the timetable of 2019. And we uh, made this choice uh, exactly for showing the situation um, without any interference from the um, change of, uh, of uh, travel time, of scheduling of uh, transport services due to the COVID-19. Thank you very much, Claudia. So this is a fantastic resource. 
um, uh, and forms just one part of a, a remarkable study. Sabine, could we turn to you now, please? Sabine uh, Zilmer, uh, who is yes. um, partner and head of the Berlin office at Spatial Foresight. Can you take us through um, the uh, many other aspects of the study, please? I, I will. Thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. And I just need to very quickly share my screen with you following um, Claudia's introduction of this really, now I'm lost. Can you still hear me? Because I can hear you and I can see your uh, introductory slide. Thank you. Great, because I, shortly everything was frozen here. Um, so following uh, Claudia's introduction to this wonderful visualization, I will focus more on, on the less visual aspects of the whole study and in, give you some glimpses on the other three main parts of the study, um, complementing this overview of cross-border public transport service provision. The first is on the obstacles um, encountered when either developing or implementing running cross-border public transport services. We have developed an inventory of such challenges and obstacles that are due to some particularities of cross-border public transport. And main drivers of um, these are either on the supply or on the demand side of the services uh, or of the in the regions, as well as on um, other drivers are institutional specific um, frameworks context, as well as the differences of legal frameworks. Um, these drivers induce a number of obstacles we have named here problems and which then have a number of negative effects and wider impacts for uh, the people in the border areas. Let me illustrate that um, at, on behalf of one fictive example. Um, we are aware of the differences of national and uh, regional uh, heterogeneous legal frameworks, not only for cross-border public transport service, but in general. So when it comes to transport, we have often differences regarding safety uh, standards, technical standards, and so on. And maybe the tramway of uh, between Strasbourg and uh, Kiel is one of the more famous examples for, of that. These differences lead to higher costs for implementing such service, for running them, or maybe even not viable at all. Um, if they cannot be implemented, then as um, Pascal in introduced uh, earlier, we reduce the accessibility for other services, not only for public services, but also for commercial services, for any type of service across the border. And this is especially true for people relying on public service provision, such as children, elderly people and others. And that overall leads to a lower quality of uh, life in, in the border regions. So this is the second main output of our study. Leading me to the third, we did not only look into what is the difficulties, but we also tried to find what can be done about that. And we developed a toolbox with some 30 approaches or tools that can be grouped along different uh, categories of, of solutions. And on that slide here, you see results from, a, uh, from some surveys we conducted in, uh, very early this year, um, where uh, survey respondents answered in how far they implemented certain solutions or not, and how successful they, they were. I cannot go to the details of that, but just let me highlight the groups of tools. So we have some um, 
legal tools on where that range from um, legislative actions at different levels to bilateral or multilateral agreements between different member states or regions. We may also have uh, solutions in planning and governance structures like involving or setting up cross-border uh, institutional structures. But we have also tools that go are more hands-on, that deal with how to improve access for people in the border regions by better ticketing, and implementing the ticketing for cross-border tickets in the wider context, for better coordination and information tools regarding, for instance, on timetables, and finally also tools that relate to what can we do to actually um, increase the demand in regions where there may be so far a lack of demand uh, for cross-border public services. This leads me to the last but not least important um, element of the study. We have also conducted some 30 case studies on all four modes uh, of transport, Claudia introduced with a web viewer. Um, naturally, most of the case studies focus on rail and bus services because they are also the vast majority of services we find in Europe, but we have also included two tramway services and uh, three um, ferry services in the case studies. These allow to give insights in this on the differences of the context we face when we uh, look into, or when we face when providing cr um, cross-border public transport services, um, and they show how the differently these services are organized, provided, what are the differences in governance, um, framework conditions, and also what are the different obstacles and solutions the service have encountered. And um, not wanting to intervene, Andrew, but in the next session, we already we will focus on the location of this uh, service here, where we get more hands-on insights on one of these examples. So this is just to give the overview where it is located. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much. That's uh, fantastic um, that you've been able to summarize so detailed and, uh, a study in such a simple, straightforward way. Thank you very much. It gives us real access to, to the shape of the study, although as Pascal rightly said, it's such a rich study there will be that I'm sure everybody will realize that they will look forward to being able to look at those 31 case studies and realize that for everybody, there is something of direct relevance uh, to their own situation that they can draw upon and look to. And that's certainly true for the toolbox. Uh, of being able to reach into that toolbox and find the solutions is really important. Before we come to Max, uh, because we have the benefit of going to, to one of those case studies and hearing directly from the uh, operator there, um, let's see the result of our first poll. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I'm hoping that it will come up. Here we go. So what is the main obstacle to initiating cross-border public transport in your region? Okay, so the leading reply, nearly half the responses are different competencies between national, regional and local authorities. This is something actually that, I mean, in a sense, that's quite heartening because this is something that, um, not least with our colleagues leading from DG Regio, um, the authorities can deal with. They can try to manage those different competencies. Uh, the the uh, second uh, equal response is different financial capacities and different technical standards. Uh, these are uh, obviously ones which the national governments really need to address on either side of the border. Uh, then lack of cross-border transport provision, provision domestically. Yes, uh, I can see that that would clearly uh, impede and lack of statistical information on demand gets a small number of responses. Uh, but I'm really struck by the uh, importance of the competencies that 
clearly demonstrates that it, this administrative obstacles are at the forefront of the response. So let's close that poll. Uh, I will um, initiate uh, the second poll. Let's bring up the second poll. Um, you, you've got a few minutes to, to think about this one. Uh, the question is, what would be the main benefits of ensuring cross-border connections by public transport? Focus on benefits. We're not asking you to choose just one. I think that would be a bit hard for people to do. Um, so we're asked, but we're asking you to uh, give us a sense of the relative significance of these benefits by choosing not more than three answers out of our five options. Respecting the environment, reducing pollution, improving mobility, accessibility and social cohesion, enhancing the labour market across the border and consumer access, building trust across borders and promoting cultural exchange. Those are our five benefits that we've uh, selected. We'd ask you to indicate which amongst those are the most important to you. Thank you. Let's turn now to, to Max. Uh, Max Gotel is uh, in charge of employee supply and infrastructure at the Centre for Public Transport and Quality Management, VBB Verkehrsverbund Berlin Brandenburg. Um, uh, you are one of those case studies in the report, Max, but um, so we're really delighted to have you here to tell us uh, in person about uh, the um, cross-border transport issues. Can you take us into the uh, case study, please, Max? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for introducing me and uh, to give me the opportunity to present those obstacles uh, my colleagues and me come, come across in our everyday work uh, when it comes to cross-border services. And I would also try to uh, showcase uh, some solutions that we've already implemented and to talk about our goals for for the near future for these services. Well, and I'm, I'm quite sure that, that many of you uh, listening and viewing this talk um, come across the same issues like, like every day. So I'm looking forward to, to the discussion in the end on what your solutions and ideas about those are. Um, first of all, I'm, I've been a bit surprised about the, the poll we've seen just, just a few seconds ago because um, who is in charge of which issue is, is for sure uh, a difficulty that we have to deal with. But um, as said, we try to, to manage with different working groups and we try to, uh, to do the best we can. And well, of course, one of the, one of the keys uh, in cross-border um, cooperation uh, is language. Uh, language to, to send messages to, to the workmates across the board in the right tone and to understand their needs. Uh, fortunately, um, VBB, which is quite hard to, to say in English, I guess. So um, if you translate it, it's the Berlin Brandenburg Transport Board more, more generally. Um, we, we managed to um, hire a German and Polish speaking transport planner, which is a big benefit, I, I can say, for for our daily work in order to communicate with, with the Polish side. Um, I don't really speak Polish, unfortunately, but I do actually speak a little bit of English. And so I try to present the case to you, but uh, please excuse myself if English is a bit rusty because I don't use it on my, on my everyday work. So, okay, um, can we have a look on, on the map? Is it, already, is it already shown? Not yet. Not yet. Um, uh, was I supposed uh, to show the map or could someone else share the map, please? Because I have not prepared it, but I can uh, continue to, to talk through it. So um, what we want to Charlotte talk about, the there. that would be very, very kind. Um, so I want to focus on the case study as we said, which is about the connection between uh, the state of Brandenburg in, in Germany from Berlin, uh, cities in Brandenburg towards uh, Lubuski in Poland, which is the voivodeship neighboring us in Poland. And uh, my employer, the, the VBB, um, is accountable for organizing rail transport, passenger information, ticketing, tariffs, and so on and so forth. 
and we want uh, to look on just, the. Just to let you know, we have the map. At least I can ah, see very well. I can we see it now. Yeah. Very well. Very good. Thanks a lot, and I'm sorry for the for the misunderstanding. No Thank problem. you for sharing the map. And I want to focus on the northernmost connections that you can connection that you can see here, which is from Berlin, uh, Ostkreuz, and Lichtenberg via Verbig uh, to Koshin and uh, uh, to Gorzow Jakopolski in Poland, which is our regional train 26. And we run an hourly service to Koshin, um, which is the first stop in Poland. And you can also buy monthly passes as well as single tickets and other kinds of tickets for this relation. But today it is on, only possible to do so via the more classic distributional channels like ticket vending machines, uh, stuff at the station, stuff at the train and so on and so forth. And to, but today we live in a world where you can buy everything online just from your couch, like food. I can even work from, well, not my couch now, but a chair at home. So that that's very convenient. And we also want to bring this convenience into uh, the distribution of ticketing for rail services. And therefore, we work together in a project that's called Rail Blue, which is for Brandenburg and L Rail for Brandenburg and Lubuski. And thereby, our our goal is to start selling uh, such tickets via online applications. So the applica our very own App Store application for BB Bus and Bahn, and the Paul Regio application, just from spring of next year and we're currently working on the more more technical aspects to implement the selling of the tickets because as uh, mr boyman mentioned we want to um, get the economic uh, benefits from our rail services and uh, increase the access to the services in a region that is not particularly uh, an economic strong region on on both sides of the borders and uh, therefore, we are working together in this project. I would like to add as um, a last point that um, also the, the funding for operation of cross-border services could uh, encourage better service patterns if we had dedicated a funding which really was for cross-border operations. I think this would be a big step forward. So this was a very short insight to the case study I was uh, happy to participate in, and I would like to and over again to Andrew Lenslake. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. Can I, um, can I just ask um, uh, uh, Andre on our um, uh, Q&A uh, has asked, what's the frequency of the service 26? It's an hourly service. Uh, and um, sorry, can I ask you, Max? Uh, Max sure. um, you were talking about the um, ticketing processes, mm -hmm. um, but um, if one buys a ticket on the train, have you got arrangements for the distribution of the revenue between the operators? Because presumably there's a, a, a shared service between more than one operator. Well, this is um, for sure always a, difficult, a difficulty to talk about the revenues. Um, if we look, uh, you <laughs> <laughs> diplomatic <laughs> answer to so to say, yeah. Well, if you've uh, you've seen the map just a few seconds ago, so our ser our hourly service just only goes to the very first station in Poland at this point, which is Kostjen, and it is uh, run by um, the same company that runs the service on on the German side, and it is um, it's not a if you look on it from from the perspective of a contract, it's not a public service, but it's um, uh, it's a revenue service between the border and Kostjen, and therefore the uh, company running the service uh, keeps the at least the the income of the um, of the Polish side of the ticket. So there is a certain amount of each ticket that is dedicated to um, to the track in Poland, and they can keep it. And then there is another ticket also available by. Uh, by VBB that goes further to Gorzo, which is the next bigger city in Poland. And there we have um, a mechanism to say to distribute the um, yeah, the income is not quite the right term. How did you how did you say to distribute revenue. the revenue? Yeah, very much. Um, 
Thank you, Max. Um, can I just ask, as you've been uh, tackling these issues and making the service more accessible, mm -hmm. have you seen an impact on demand for the service? So this is clearly an area where there's quite a bit of travel to work taking place, isn't there? Has that, has that shifted? Have you seen an increase? There absolutely uh, is a high demand starting in Poland, going all the way to, to Berlin. Um, we have the the classic distributional channels for for many years now so for a couple of years so i can not quite um quite say that there has been an increase in demand within within the last years and we try to implement the mobile devices and the online tickets by next year and then hopefully see another uh, increase in in demand but by now, as you know, with uh, the coronavirus, it's challenging anyway to um, to talk about changes in demand because of this effect. So one, one last question before we go to the panel, Max. Can you say something about, I'm asked by Stefan on our uh, question and answers. Um, mm -hmm. Can you say something about the Kulturzag, intention, mode of running and results? That's uh, That's an interesting one. The culture, Zach. Okay, that is Kulturzug. this might, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Kulturzug or train of culture, or it. or Pochong do Kulture is is shown in my background. So this might be a little bit misleading, as it is not the the focus on today's study. But this is a product that we've implemented when Wrocław became a European city of culture in 2016, I believe. And the train is running since then with uh, the focus on culture program during the train ride. So to make the long journey more uh, more interesting for the the passengers. And we still try to, we want to uh, carry on with the service, but it is quite challenging due to the uh, uh, current Corona and financial situation. But it is running every weekend. So if you want to go from Berlin or Cottbus to Wrocław, you can use it and um, have some discussions or maybe little theater pieces or language bits on, on the train. Oh, sounds fascinating. Thank you very much. And thank you Welcome. for that question. So, Max, thank you very much for, for, for telling us about the, uh, uh, your own circumstances and the issues that you've been dealing with. Um, you're going to stay with us for the panel discussion. Can I remind... Absolutely. Uh, everybody participating that we uh, would be very glad now to take your questions uh, and feed those into our panel. Uh, our panel um, includes Max, uh, Sabine from whom we heard previously, we'll, we'll hear again from Pascal before the end, but we're joined by Ricardo Ferreira from DG Regio in the Commission. Now, welcome Ricardo. And we have with us Artur uh, Perchel, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the Europe Department at the International Association of Public Transport. So welcome, Artur. Uh, and also Loic Delhuven, who is the Director General of the ECGT, that is the Euro Metropole running from Lille to Tournai, France to Belgium. So Loic, very, you're very welcome too. Can I just, before we uh, actually um, move into questions as such and give people an opportunity to uh, hear the uh, um, discussion and ask their own questions. Let's see the, I'm sure the panel will all be interested to see the results of the second poll. So let's bring that up. Here we go. So um, notwithstanding Max's um, interesting description of the opportunity for transport itself to be a cultural experience, promoting cultural exchanges doesn't uh, get the highest proportion, but it does get a proportion of the votes. Um, up there at the top is improving mobility, accessibility and social cohesion. That's really a, a good thing to see happening. Uh, unsurprisingly, enhancing the labour market across the border, as we were just hearing from Max with the case study there, there's a lot of travel to work taking place over borders. Um, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see that respecting the environment and reducing pollution also features amongst our top benefits uh, to, to be derived from cross-border public transport. Building trust across the border, it may be that that's, that less, that's less a feature because people feel that the trust exists. I hope that's the case. Um, and that actually the cross-border public transport is a practical benefit of um, mobility, travel to work, 
uh, and uh, improving the environment. I hope we see all that. So that's what our participants feel are the benefits that uh, cross-border public transport can give us. Um, before we go answer questions as such, I wonder if I might ask um, Artur and Loic just to respond to the um, presentation of the forthcoming study. Tell us a bit about what their anticipation is and their hopes are for how this study can make a difference to cross-border public transport. Artur, would you be kind enough just to maybe to introduce your own work in this respect and your organisation and um, your initial response? Very much so. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. Well, as you may know, UITP has been working with uh, local regional public transport operators and authorities. Uh, we are working with more than 2,000 organizations of such sort. In Europe, it's, uh, it's half of this number, so it's a uh, plenty of networks. Uh, many of them engage also in the cross-border uh, cross uh, transport provision. Uh, some of them of the, on the PSO obligations, some of them on the commercial basis. But indeed, I mean, for us as a representatives of the local public transport, you know, the cross-border is, is definitely growing in importance. Obviously, cross-border meaning local, not uh, international services. This is a important distinction to, to note. But, you know, also looking forward to the study, I believe, uh, particularly now in the context of the COVID, um, public transport, also the services on the cross-border sections, are at the turning point. And you have seen this on the, on the last uh, poll that we had just uh, a few minutes ago. You know, we, there is a huge potential at the cross-border side, not only in terms of the behavioral change, uh, shifting people away from cars uh, towards more collective modes of transportation. But also there is a challenge, as we've seen from Max, uh, there is a number of obviously opportunities, but also challenges to provide more and better commercial services. Uh, obviously, the cross-border services are by design not made to you know, hit the market and uh, provide revenues to the operators. That's why the regulatory, the governing framework is extremely important. And I believe also what the study will show, and I'm very much encouraged by the, the web viewer, uh, what's uh, equally important is this both financing and non-financing tools that we've seen. Great example is the Interreg uh, financing. But look, I mean, only the study that we've seen at the web viewer, you know, the provision of data, it's extremely important for us as users, for us as uh, stakeholders, but also for the policymakers uh, to make sure that the informed choices are made. So the technical assistance, data collection and analysis, I believe the best case study uh sharing e events like this also the you know boost the interest and importance of the cross border so there is a plenty of of uh, aspects both to to our discussion today but also to the forthcoming studies so i'm very much looking forward to to have it uh, you know uh, on the on the table soon Arthur, thank you very much we'll come back to you in a minute with uh, questions but uh let's also uh introduce loic uh, Loic, can you tell us a bit about your uh, the work of your organisation and, and your experience and perhaps reflection on uh, how the study can be of value? Yes, for sure, Andrew, thank you. It's okay for my presentation? Hmm. Yes? Yes, please. Okay. So um, to introduce a little bit my presentation, our metropolis represents uh, 40, uh, 84 of the 620 uh, kilometer of the French Belgian border. So the reality of our cross-border regions is the following, 700,000 people living in the cross-border uh, area, approximately 50,000 cross-border workers per day. Um, 92% of the students uh, are uh, going to uh, one school in Belgium and are French. Uh, only two cross-border train connection taking more than uh, 35 minutes to cover the distance between towns that are only 25, 20 kilometers apart. One cross-border connection by bus, only one, 
mainly used used by uh, students, so it's not really uh, really good for the cross border um, co uh, transportation. Um, the reason why uh, citizens uh, cross the border are to make their everyday uh, purchases, uh, to get an education, to uh, work, and of course to leisure activities. This is without a doubt um, uh, a cross-border living area, but we have also, uh, and we don't uh, consider the border as a dead end. It's really important. Nevertheless, only 5% of cross-border travel takes place by public transport in the Euro Metropolis, near Cortaic Tournai. Traveling by car is still considered to be the better alternative than using the train, for instance. Uh, another reason is the lack of cross-border connections, both uh, regards having modes, modes of transport like trains or buses as a regard soft mobility, which requires specific infrastructure. This is therefore a large potential for the development of public transport in the cross-border regions. However, it still needs to be structured and threatened. For the border of cross-border citizens, the presence of a real cross-border mobility network infrastructure, uh, uh, price, alignment, um, communication would make traveling more efficient, which would in turn have a significant economic and environment impact. What could Europe to do uh, with local partners? At the end of 2018, a declaration of intent in favor of cross-border mobility was signed by France and Belgium. The Euro Metropolis is progressively developing a cross-border governance adapted to benefit sustainable cross-border mobility. These basic elements could be boosted by technical guidance for the overall analysis of the problems in order to find solutions in terms of connections or where reasons, regulations between the regions. The Euro Metropolis can not solve a macro-regional problem alone, the cross-border regions, which have a high potential in terms of logistic, further of multimodal, uh, multitude of multimodal sites, in particular with price transport concerns. In short public, uh, transport should uh, be able to integrate both AV modes of transport, train, tram, metro, bus, and soft modes of transport into the intermodal and multimodal concept for the daily movements of the inhabitants of the border regions. The EGTC make it possible to bring the stakeholders together and have them enter into a dialogue with respect to governance practices that are useful for the development of ad hoc services for the everyday life of the citizens of the cross-border regions. Europe can play a role in this respect, providing support for the improvement of the services offered by the race railroads, as well as providing guidance for the development of a global visions that purchases the uh, surpasses sorry, the borders, and to enable the intelligence intelligence interweaving a connections of actions undertaken by the different countries as regards transport to enable the creations of models to observe the different options in the impact of the environment and to further encourage the local stakeholders to drastically transform their regions where polluting vehicles are often not yet banned. In this respect, technical support would be very welcome and ad hoc funding as well, of course. Thank you for your intention. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, we have one or two questions coming in already uh, and can I encourage our participants now to put their questions in on the Q&A and we'll um, take those to our panelists. Um, can, I, can I also, however, just start by taking um, one of those questions to you, Ricardo, if I may, just an opportunity for you to say a word, perhaps by way of response to the presentations. Uh, and also Martin Unfried is asking, do we need changes in EU legislation on public procurement to make the financing of cross-border connections easier? So, given your role uh, right at the heart of uh, the European Union, you might be able to look at that question of whether EU legislation is the relevant uh, mechanism for tackling financing of cross-border connections. 
Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Martin, for the question. It's quite interesting. The issue, I will not comment on the specific case of EU procurement law. I'm not that spe specialist on EU procurement law to go in details on that one. But when we look at the challenges posed by EU legislation in national legislation, we frequently see that the challenges with EU legislation lay on the lack of transposition or incompatible transpositions in many different cases. In the different inventories we have of cross-border obstacles, we frequently see that case. If I link this to the study, one of the most interesting elements of the study from my perspective is that it gives us a pan-European mindset. It gives us a borderless mindset. It is not a study within the framework of a national border because it's precisely that framework of a national border that is in my generation that is challenging the development of cross-border mobility. Luik just has just clearly shown that although it's one area of intense interaction where we would assume that there would be a very fluid, very solid public transport services, we only see those very solid public transport services on one side or on the other side, not making the connection. Why is this? It's our mindset. I remember that when I was a kid in primary school, I was taught the geography of my country, Portugal, like a rectangle. On one side, there was blue because it was the ocean. On the other side, just across the border, everything was gray, as if the territory did not exist. We all all of us, we have learned with this mindset of national borders. The problem is when we get to positions in which we need to develop networks, in which we need to do spatial planning, in which we need to have uh, make policy decisions for investments, we keep this mindset. Therefore, all the networks of public transport in most cases have been set with this mindset. The challenge here is precisely to change this mindset and be capable to look at the territory in a border region, the territory of a person should be all the territory around that person, regardless of if there is if there's a borderline in between. And this is the great advantage. The detail of, of, the, of the law, in many cases it will, because also in the process of in the legislative process, doing the law, we, we do it with our own mindsets. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. And let's, Sabina, can we co could we come back to you, please? Because Giula on the Q&A is asking an interesting question. Uh, the, the mapping um, is leading us closer to defining the cross-border functional areas. Indeed, that is true. We're beginning to see the possibilities here. but. Uh, um, do you know, is there a possibility to get an insight into the numbers of passengers, the volumes of uh, the of flow of passengers uh, on these uh, connections? Um, it's something we have been struggling a lot with, honestly okay. speaking. Um, providers partially, uh, in, in the case studies, uh, we, we tried to work on that and partially we got that information. Uh, partially we did not get it and, and uh, partially it may not be wished to be shared uh, because it's, it's uh, the providers who can only give us that numbers yeah, yeah. except when we, we managed to, to do some more general polls and whatsoever but uh, it, it's very difficult so far um, at least uh, with a overall overview right. to make it short <laughs> okay so no, in no. the case studies you will find a few examples where where we see also changes and and we see how demand has developed a role in, in general but in in detail it is um not widely available so far we would love mm -hmm. to have more <laughs> <laughs> but actually once the web viewer is uh, in um use and people are seeing it as a mechanism for understanding the shape of cross-border public transport right across Europe. I think people will want to populate it with more information, won't they? Uh, I mean, will you be able to have, will people be able to have links through so they can they can look at a, um, a pick up on, on all these services and find additional links through that will give them more information about them? So far, it's exactly what 
um, Claudia has shared sure. with us and anything else on how to further develop that um, that that's up to um, yeah did you read you further elaborations and and I think as the study is just coming to an end uh, this simply is is one of the probably next steps to decide on on how to make it an even more um, extensive knowledge base how to embed it in, in further um, knowledge tools and and provide give it a richer uh, knowledge base um no wait, can i ask you we heard from max about the uh ticketing uh, uh issues uh, in in the berlin brandenburg um train system um from your point of view are you have you been able to resolve all of the ticketing issues? Can people buy tickets um, in all the physical ways and online and uh, tickets that take them through and into um, from Belgium into France and vice versa? Yeah, yes, we, we have an integrated price for the two regions, but we have also some problems when you take your ticket train in an automatic shop of uh, or in an, uh, way, uh, in another way by internet. So we have um, three uh, prices, one for the international, one the regional, and one for the cross-border. But now we have a common price for the three, uh, three ways to go to, the, to cross the border. And it's really important. It's a good job to, between the public transport uh, in uh, SNCF, and uh, SNCB in Belgium, and also the Région de France uh, between the, the dialogue. That is very interesting. And now we study the possibility to have external um, tickets to go to the France, to Belgium, with uh, a multimodal approach, uh, with a, a, a tram ticket to go to the train ticket. And it's also uh, in, uh, in a good case of studies, uh, and it was a, a good uh, um, meeting with the public transportation in uh, Tournai and in Cortrec and also in the uh, race. How, 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 how did you resolve the ticketing uh, issues in the past? Was it done between the passenger transport authorities on either side, or is it led by the commercial transport operators themselves? It was, an, um, it was an, uh, a discussion between the public authorities mm -hmm. and also uh, with the uh, Région de France, so the good competencies between Région de France and also the uh, Belgium. So it's not really at the same level for these uh, questions, but we have also around the table, uh, we put, uh, with EGTC, we have we put it, uh, the we put the the all the um, stakeholders around the table, and we have a common uh, solutions for that. But it's uh, yes, it's a long time once since uh, ten years for mm -hmm. to to have a common solution. So it's not a really uh, it's not really uh, easy to to have a common solution in this case. Once we have also different culture in France and in Belgium to have uh, ticketing. So it's not really uh, easy to, yes, to have a common, to have a French Belgium uh, ticketing. But for, for, example, for this example, it's okay. But we also, another problem, it's the control, the control to control the, the, the several ticketing. Once it's really also a big challenge uh, for our uh, cross-border regions for uh, at this moment. We have no, it's not really, um, it's not possible to, for a French controller to control a Belgian ticket and also the, uh, the reverse. So yes, it's also the, another problem for that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Can I just come to, uh, to on this, uh, I mean, we're, we're delving now into the toolbox in effect, you know, what are the mechanisms by which one can resolve some of these issues? And what Loic was describing was that, uh, you know, the problem might be a ticketing, a through ticketing issue, but the solution is in the administrative context of bringing together the competencies of different levels on different sides of the border and bring them together around the table. Is that a, is that some, I mean, is, is in the toolbox, there is the um, references, obviously they're drawn from examples in the case studies, but examples of very specific 
um, cross-border transport agreements between uh, the, the, the relevant administrations on either side of the border? Is that a, is that a profitable route that people are taking? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I believe it is. I mean, if you are looking on the also the number of stakeholders that are engaged on both sides of the border, uh, this is one of the one of the challenge. But this could be turned into a opportunity. Once more, what I really would like to stress here for the sake of our discussion is that you know when you the fundamental thing behind cross border public transportation services is that these remain local. If you have a local uh, transport authorities on both sides of the border, that can come to a you know, workable solution in terms of under public service obligation or under public service contracting. I mean, you see also in the, in the report and throughout Europe, a number of case studies where this works well. I also saw the question in the chat on the cabotage, but this is, you know, let's be honest, a bit of a side issue. I believe, you know, there is a definitely a way forward for a number of stakeholders. You have operators, you have authorities. Obviously, there are multiple of side challenges in terms of language, technical barriers, even harmonization of the timetables, which is sometimes proved to be a huge obstacle. To overcome, so yeah, I believe there is a there is a way forward, as you as you mentioned. And, um, but obviously, there are now. I believe there is a, a huge issue, even not you know going even more deeper into the fundamentals than than the problem you you were describing. I think for for us as a public transport local public transport community, what has to happen is definitely shift of focus towards. Uh, cross-border regions. I remember from our excellent uh, conference in 2019, Ricardo and Pascal organized on cross-border services. That is, if I'm not mistaken, around 44% of the border populations uh, have access to, to any sort of rail services. This is very little. So if you, even if you digitalize, if you the cooperation, if you have a smooth running, you still have to have a number of other factors for cross-border transport not only to develop, but even to exist in a fashionable way for, and particularly for the users to, to make work out of it. Mm, so I believe, you know, winning the trust of the passengers, particularly now after COVID, you know, COVID destroyed a lot of, you know, cross-border, this, this trust that was enhanced and built throughout the decades. Now everybody took cars and I believe, you know, any solution that there is, and also a number of tools that are described in the toolbox, will be of, uh, of huge value, but uh, please do not underestimate also very simple tools such as communication towards passengers, the communication from the public transport authorities and so forth. I believe this is of fundamental value now. Um, we've got a number of questions. Let me take one to uh, Ricardo. Uh, if we can't answer questions straight away, Ricardo, we can definitely kind of um, ask people to uh, reply to the questions on the Q&A itself. So do please have a look if they're, if they're directed to you or you feel you can answer them on the Q&A. Do please do that, uh, panelists, please. But Ricardo, uh, Andre is asking a question about, obviously in places like where we're hearing from Max, there's a lot of demand. What about uh, the solutions where there is, uh, by its nature, low densities of population and limited demand? This question is quite interesting because it puts the emphasis precisely on what, our, what are our assumptions a priori. We assume in, when looking to some territories, like the borders that Andre is uh, talking about, there's low demand, therefore it's difficult or impossible to provide public transport services across the border. But if we are on those same borders, we, the state, the society, the public budgets, whatever it is, if we are providing public transport service on one side, under PSO, under public service obligations, and on the other side, under PSO, under public service obligations, why not to have PSO across? In a low density territory, one of the issues that we need to promote development is precisely to improve scale is precisely to enhance interactions. If in such a territory where we have public transport on one side plus on the other side, if we take the step to make public transport across, 
then the network increases, the market increases for public transport operators, and the accessibility increases for people. This contributes to invert the problems of low density. It's precisely on these details looking at the cross-border territory as if it is a natural, equal, non-discriminated territory like the others. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the answers that I see are coming uh, in on the Q&A to some of the additional questions because they're very interesting. Can I just say time is as always against us. We've, got a, we've had a fantastically rich uh, study presented here and a lot of very interesting points uh, made by all of our panelists. Thank you all very much indeed. Can I thank all of our panelists uh, and um, move to Pascal uh, again. Pascal, would you, I think we have a, just a few minutes. I think it'd be really helpful. You're, you're having an opportunity to listen not only to the presentations, but to look at the questions. I wondered if you wanted to give uh, us all a few conclusions that you would draw and about next steps. Pascal, please. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I was just a little bit disconnected because I was changing to panelists. So I, I, I didn't fully grasp uh, your question, but maybe for, for the wrap up uh, and for the conclusions. Well, thanks, first of all, for, for, for everybody participating in this uh, interesting debate. And indeed, uh, time is against us. I think we could have easily continued further discussion, but maybe we should do that and find, uh, find another way or another meeting where we can do this. Uh, first of all, uh, I think what several people said, but I think it was came also for me clearly back in one of the slides from Luik saying, well, a border region is actually is a crossroads huh? it, and it's not a dead end. And I think that tells it, it tells it all. I think it also goes a bit back to what uh, Ricardo said, talking about the mindset huh? or that we are very much all we think we grow up with a kind of a national uh, bias, uh, national background. So we, we're not by nature uh, built to think across borders. And I think, but this is something which we should try to break through. And that also applies to, 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 to many things, but it also applies here to cross-border public transport services. So uh, there's a kind of encouragement for, for public transport services to look beyond their national borders, their national horizon, and might find also interesting business opportunities and profitable uh, services on the other side. If they can integrate these, these uh, public transport services, you become to a more uh, interesting business model than if you would only uh, apply it on, on your side of the border. And even maybe in many cases, it might still not be 100% profitable. So then we have to think indeed to how we can support this with uh, public support, especially in low density regions, uh, and also see how we can, can change the regulatory and governance framework in order to build up this kind of cross-border public service. And that also what I understood a bit from Arthur, that we should actually allow local public transport operators to give them some freedom and flexibility to make their own arrangements and not being constantly constrained by all kinds of national rules or, or uh, restrictions. So there should be some flexibility should be built into the system so that uh, local operators, uh, especially at that level, can find, uh, can find themselves and come to a common model. So I think those uh, were some of the conclusions, at least what, what I draw from the, from the debate. Um, uh, I would encourage everybody to, to, to have a look at the toolbox and to read the toolbox when you're thinking about developing or exploring the possibilities for this type of cross-border services. Use the toolbox, avoid mistakes which have already been made in, by previous cases, uh, learn the lessons from, from, from the case studies, and I think that, that, uh, that I think is encouragement for, for, for everybody to do this. When you encounter administrative or institutional obstacles, and you would like to seek for some advice, please look at, at the Border Focal Point Network, um, the, the, the options under the B Solutions Initiative, where we have also some kind of, uh, where we also had some projects linked to public transport, where we can offer small scale advisory support, at least uh, define some, some pathways for possible solutions. So that I think is another tool which we make available to everybody. And I think it's a very good and interesting tool and it has proven to be successful. Of course, within, in, within Interact, we will continue to look how we can support also uh, the further development of cross-border uh, public transport services in specific programs. 
And I hope that we, with this breakfast debate, we triggered your interest, your curiosity, so that you will be uh, 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 eagerly waiting until the, the final report will be published. That will be within the, the coming one or two weeks. So it will be soon available again on this uh, Border Focal Point network. And uh, we're always available for follow-up questions or debates. So thank you very much uh, from my side to, to all the participants. And, uh, and uh, I give the hand over back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Pascal. And can I uh, echo that uh, thanks to all of our participants um, and uh, to our panelists who, who have all made, I feel, really interesting contributions. Um, and, and I just want to uh, once again say I'm, I'm so impressed by the quality and the scope and the richness of what's been prepared in this study and people will look forward to it i'm sure and your advice is absolutely excellent pascal there is a lot of there are a lot of tools in this toolbox and they have they are those that have been used by people in the case studies so this is not a theoretical study it is a practical study uh, and uh, people can look for practical tools um, from the study and from their colleagues in the network to enable them to um, meet their challenges and to improve the quality of life and the sustainability of their cross-border transport. Um, we've uh, had an excellent discussion. Time is against us. We cannot um, continue now, but I know through the Border Focal Point Network, this will be a continuing discussion as part of a, um, a, a very productive set of uh, activities in the network to deliver cross-border regions that are great places to live. Thank you all very much indeed for being with us this morning. We look forward to seeing you again soon and we look forward uh, to this excellent study in the uh, just a couple of weeks ahead. Thank you very much, Pascal and all of our colleagues. And have a very good day. <laughs>